After years of delay, Intel's 10 nanometer processors are finally here. Intel invited us down to Santa Clara to test out its new Ice Lake mobile CPUs, and we threw every test at them that we could manage. We've been expecting these chips for more than three years, so have they been worth the wait? Mostly. Let's get into it. Welcome to Upscaled, our explainer show where we look at the parts that make your tech better. You folks were super positive about our Zen 2 breakdown and we really appreciate it. We work hard to make this stuff as interesting and accurate as possible and it's great to know you're enjoying it. And yes, I should have said third gen Ryzen, not Ryzen 3. Sorry about that. Though, can we all agree the names are super confusing? Now, I know a lot of you were expecting our look at AMD's RDNA graphics cards this week, and that is coming, but we got a chance to go hands-on with Intel's new Ice Lake CPUs, and we just couldn't pass that up. Let's check it out. All right, so we are down here in Santa Clara in the South Bay near Intel's campus, and we are here to check out some 10 nanometer processors in some new laptops. Now, you know all the history with these, we've been waiting for them for years, but finally they are going to be arriving soon in laptops you can buy. What we have here today are these software development systems. It's these unbranded blank slate laptops that Intel uses internally to test their software. But we're gonna go hands on with them. We're gonna run a ton of software, a ton of tests and a bunch of games and we'll let you know how they do. First, a little background. There are two ways to make a chip faster. You can either develop a better design, called the architecture, or you can build it with smaller transistors on a more efficient manufacturing process, called a node. Smaller transistors are better for a few reasons. First, the electrons have to physically travel less distance, so signals can reach their destinations faster. Second, transistors do the work of processing, and if they're smaller, you can just pack more of them onto a chip, and third, smaller transistors can switch faster and they use less energy doing so. So this here is Intel's SDS or Software Development System. This is a sort of internal testing laptop. It's unbranded, it's made by Intel. So this is not necessarily what we're gonna see from a final machine, but it is the test platform the new 10 nanometer Ice Lake chips are installed in. And we get to sit with this thing all day, run whatever tests we want and see how it does. And we are gonna start with two of everyone's favorites, the basics, 3D Mark and PC Mark. So let's see how it performs. Starting around 2006, Intel adopted a production schedule called TikTok, where every year they'd either release a new chip manufactured on a new node, the TIC, or based on a new architecture, the TOC. And this worked great until they hit their 14 nanometer node in 2015 and just got stuck. When 10 nanometer should have appeared the following year, we just got another revision of 14 nanometer, which is then what we've had every year since then. There are a lot of challenges in making smaller transistors, and at this point, some of the features on a chip are only atoms across. Seems like Intel underestimated how difficult manufacturing these tiny, tiny devices was going to be. To be fair, this was something of a self-inflicted wound. Intel's goals for 10 nanometer were seriously impressive, which is something we'll take a look at in a minute. But did years of hard work and delays pay off? Back to the testing. It's not quite enough to just get these results. We really need a basis for comparison. And for that, we brought along everyone's favorite little laptop, the XPS 13. Now this is a previous generation chip, but it operates in the same power envelope at about 15 to 20 watts of power. And it should give us a great sense of how much things have improved from one generation to the next. Some caveats with our testing. Most of these benchmarks we only had time to run once when we'd really prefer a few tries to rule out weird outliers. We also couldn't test for battery life, which is one area these chips promise to bring big improvements. So what did we find out? The XPS 13 is running a four core i7 8565U chip at 1.8 gigahertz with a 4.6 gigahertz boost and 16 gigs of RAM while the Ice Lake system is a four core chip clocked at 1.3 gigahertz with a 3.9 gigahertz boost and eight gigs of RAM. So while the XPS definitely has the advantage in terms of clock speed and memory, it didn't always come out ahead. All right, we're just getting our first results here. This is gonna take a while. We're actually gonna be here all day running tests on these machines. It's not exactly a fast process, but we're gonna learn something. In PC Mark, we got a result of 4365, which is pretty good for an Ultrabook. 
3D graphics tests with 3D Mark were even better, with a score of 7,878 in Night Raid and 781 in Time Spy. Though these tests did show that there may still be some bugs to fix, with several of them showing weird color glitches at the edges of the screen. That's definitely not intentional. Uh, might still be some driver issues to work out here. In PC Mark, the XPS 13 was about 7% slower than the Ice Lake system, and the differences were even greater in 3D Mark, with the XPS slower by 33% in Night Raid and 38% in Time Spy. So we just got through our first round of PC Mark and 3D Mark, and we are seeing a definite advantage for the new chips. Now, the one thing we are seeing, it's way faster on GPU, by upwards of like 50% in some cases. It is lagging a little bit on CPU, at least in the 15 watt setup we have right now. We just ran Geekbench 4, which is a definitely synthetic benchmark. It means it's not really doing real world testing, but it's a measure of potential capability. And the newer chip, faster across the board. About 10% faster in single core, maybe 15% faster in multi-core. And we're actually seeing about a third faster in OpenCL. That's the GPU benchmark. So that's pretty impressive. just finished all of our kind of synthetic benchmarks and tests of raw performance outside of the real world and some actual content creation benchmarks. Now, we did run ADA64, which is a pretty granular test, but we're not entirely sure of its reliability because one of the issues with running on pre-release hardware is these haven't all been validated with the testing software, so some things may be a little wonky. But we did see about 1.1 teraflops of GPU performance in the new Ice Lake system, which is impressive and about what we would expect. On the CPU side, we saw cache speeds significantly higher than on the older chips here in the XPS. That means this system is in theory much faster at moving around data and actually processing and moving information through the CPU. Beyond that, in some of our content creation benchmarks, a little more real world tests. The NEAT benchmark made by the people who make NEAT video denoiser is a test of denoising some frames of video and saw Ice Lake about a frame and a half per second ahead of the XPS. Similarly, Handbrake, which is a test of encoding, we actually put in a 4K file from this camera and turned it into an MP4. And actually, Ice Lake was a little slower in that one, but going to H.265 using Intel's built-in encoder, it did pull ahead by about eight seconds, which is a decent margin. We do think this is running at lower power and definitely at a slower clock speed, so still being quicker in a real-world test like that is impressive. In Cinebench, we saw a huge GPU lead here on the Ice Lake system, and beyond that, we saw a decent increase in multi-core speed, but a little slower in single core. In the newer Cinebench benchmark, R20, that actually flipped. We're not sure why. It might have to do with the instruction sets they have available. We're not entirely sure. Speaking of instructions, we did see some pretty impressive results in ADA64's tests that leverage the AVX instruction sets. These are special instructions that let the CPU crunch huge sets of data at once, and it includes the new AVX512 instructions, which are available in a mobile chip for the first time in Ice Lake. In the AES256 test, which measures encryption, Ice Lake scored a whopping 43,807 to the XPS's 15,583, more than three times the performance. For context, the 8-core 5 gigahertz 9900K in my desktop scored just slightly higher at 44,628. So we've been running all our tests so far at a 15-watt configuration, which is what you might expect in an Ultrabook or a lower-end laptop, but these machines can actually switch their power envelope, and we are going to flip to a 25-watt configuration, which should give us a bit of a speed boost, and that is a little more what you would see from still a thin in life, but a performance laptop. Bumping up the power on these chips to 25 watts doesn't increase the frequencies, but it should increase the length of time the chip can spend at its higher boost speed. In some tests, we saw actually no difference. PC Mark actually dropped 100 points to 4271, and Geekbench barely changed at all. 3D Mark also saw some big boosts, with Night Raid gaining more than 20% to 9672, and Time Spy gaining about 17% to 910. 
We are gonna switch it into 25 watts for the rest of the game testing because who's trying to game at ultra low power anyways? We only had time to test a few games, but it confirmed to us how much the new Iris Plus GPU is an improvement over Intel's usual integrated graphics. In Civilization VI, the Ice Lake managed a reasonable 29.8 frames per second, while the XPS was just shy of 15. And in the Civ VI AI test, which calculates how long it would take a late game AI opponent to complete their turn, Ice Lake came in at 55 seconds a turn, while the XPS was a glacial 113 seconds. Neither of these systems are really designed for high-end gaming, but we still tried out Shadow of the Tomb Raider. With the settings at uh, lowest and anti-aliasing turned off, Ice Lake did 22 frames per second at 1080 and 31 frames per second at 720 resolution. Not exactly the ideal way to play this gorgeous game, but way better than the virtual slideshow from the XPS at 9 and 13 frames per second, respectively. Blizzard is famously good at making games that can run on low-end hardware, and Overwatch looked promising. We booted up a game versus the AI because I didn't want to subject my human teammates to my testing during a real match, and got 49 frames per second at 900p with the graphic settings at low and a 75% render scale. However, that 49 frames per second was wildly irregular, with peaks as high as 60, but crashing down to 20 frames per second or less with multiple opponents on screen. Switching to 720p with a 50% render scale and no anti-aliasing improved things and got us a pretty smooth 66 frames per second, though with some seriously jagged graphics. Still, it was better than the XPS, which could only sustain a stuttering 48 frames per second at the same settings. Finally, we played something you might actually enjoy on a laptop like this, Dead Cells. This indie action hit has gorgeous 2D graphics and they don't put much of a strain on a system. Our Ice Lake laptop managed a smooth 145 frames per second at 1080, with even the XPS managing a totally playable 84. So how big an improvement is this chip? Well, considering the Ice Lake CPU was clocked lower than the XPS, it was still faster in most workloads, though not all of them. The multi-core performance especially got a big boost, and we're not entirely sure why. It may have to do with the faster cache speeds doing a better job of keeping the CPU cores from having to sit around waiting for work. The biggest improvement is definitely graphics performance, with Intel taking advantage of the smaller transistors and CPU cores to double the number of execution units, their fancy name for graphics cores, 264. These execution units are actually relatively unchanged changed from the previous generation. No huge architecture redesigns here, but just having more of them seriously improves graphic performance. So will these processors be competitive? Well, it's hard to say. The two big chip makers have weirdly partitioned the market, with AMD currently having no laptop chips based on its new Zen 2 design, and Intel not planning a new desktop grade 10 nanometer chip until at least 2020. Compared to, say, AMD's current Ryzen 3700U mobile chips, these Ice Lake chips could be an appealing proposition, with some of our tests suggesting the new chips will not only be faster, but considering the 3700U is based on the now relatively outdated 12 nanometer process, Ice Lake may use less power too. But wait, you might be thinking, AMD is using a seven nanometer process for its new chips. That has to be better than Intel's 10 nanometer process, right? Once it puts out new laptop chips, it'll take back the performance crown no problem, right? Well, here's where I regret to inform you that the node names are mostly marketing nonsense. Smaller numbers from a given company do usually mean better performance, but it's hard to compare between companies. In terms of transistors per millimeter, which is an important metric of potential performance, Intel's 10 nanometer process actually packs in just over 100 million transistors per square millimeter, which is more than AMD's 7 nanometer process at 96.49 million transistors per square millimeter. And yes, I know AMD's chips are actually made by the Taiwanese chip making giant TSMC, but the point stands. As of this moment, with these new Ice Lake chips, Intel has arguably reclaimed the technical advantage, though TSMC is already planning a 7 nanometer plus process that will boost transistor density to a claimed 114 million per square millimeter. So Intel's lead may not last for long. Being mobile chips, a ton of Ice Lake's potential performance is going to be limited by available cooling and power, and those features will be set by the final manufacturers, so it's hard to say how the final chips will perform. 
Our test systems weren't exactly high-end laptop bodies, so performance may improve from some manufacturers, or power and heat may even get tuned down for ultra-slim machines. We'll get our hands on some of those systems as soon as we can, and we will let you know. But for now, it's safe to say that Intel has brought the fight back to the processor space, at least when it comes to laptops. But what about desktops? Well, in the high-end space, AMD currently beats Intel in most productivity tests and can more or less match it in gaming. An Ice Lake desktop chip, a 10990K perhaps, could be seriously speedy, maybe as much as 15% faster than AMD's current flagship while using similarly little power. However, it seems like we won't see a chip like that till at least 2020 and honestly probably not till 2021. By then, AMD will probably be at Zen 3 on that TSMC 7 nanometer plus node, so it's extremely hard to predict who will be on top in the future. What we do know is that Intel is planning to announce new higher-end mobile chips at the end of August, possibly a replacement for the 9750H or similar chips. These parts usually come in around 40 watts and generally fall within the gaming laptop but not totally crazy segment of the market, like the 15-inch razor blade, the Gigabyte Aorus, or the Alienware M15. Intel already owns this space, and a new high-end chip, one that is faster than AMD and can boost battery life by maybe 30%, could make for some seriously impressive laptops. Let us know what you think about all this. Are these performance numbers appealing to you? And how do you feel about Intel entirely staying out of the high-end market, at least for the time being? Is there anything you were particularly impressed by or features you wish you'd see that we just didn't have here? Let us know what you think and be sure to subscribe. We'll be bringing you that RDNA deep dive as soon as we can, so keep watching.